I have some quotes that I'm going to share, but I don't think they're in your notes. Just checking to make sure before we begin. Okay. This is from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 603, which you don't have in these notes. Um, if you get the notes from the prophecy school that we did called The Walls of This Vineyard, um, this is my presentation number four. You can find these notes, but if it's important to you. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 603 says, Since the days of Joshua... The government had never been conducted with so great wisdom and success as under Samuel's administration. Divinely invested with the threefold office of judge, prophet, and priest, he labored with untiring, disinterested zeal for the welfare of his people, and the nation had prospered under his wise control. So <clears throat> some of you may not have been here last night in just kind of a, an overview of something. But we're understanding now that, and now you at least have the logic even if you haven't tested it, the characteristics of the Sunday law, the loud cry, you can see them often in the characteristics of the midnight cry. Okay, the midnight cry, the image of the beast test begins when this when a Sunday law arrives in the United States, it's not this Sunday law, it's the Sunday law that marks the progression of the image of the beast going up. All right. So you got a Sunday law here, you got a Sunday law here, you got a midnight cry here, you got a midnight cry here, a loud cry here, um, and several other characteristics, but this is all understandable when you realize that this history here, from here to here, is a fractal of this history. This history will possess the same characteristics as this entire history. And we're understanding that, let me get it a little bit more symmetrical to make my point, that there's an angel that comes down here and an angel that came down here. All right, this was typified by October 22nd, 1844, where the third angel arrived. So when this is, reaches its perfect fulfillment in our history at the Sunday Law, then there's going to be an angel that comes down. All right, and there's an angel that comes down here at 9-11. And so we're knowing that for the Millerites, on October 22nd, 1844, the temple in heaven was opened according to Revelation 11, verse 19. Okay, so when the, when the Sunday Law arrives, once again, somehow, some way, the temple in heaven will be opened. And it says, and the ark of his testament was seen. But, because of the fractals in which we're dealing with, we know the temple is going to get opened here, too, at the midnight cry. All right, so, we're understanding that when the temple is opened in Revelation, I think it's verse 19 of chapter 11, is that where it says it? Anyone checking me to see if I'm accurate? Okay, so when it's opened, what do they see? They see the Ark of His Testament, right? And Samuel, we're saying that, what I'm saying here, is there was a man of God that came and gave a warning message to Eli, and Eli represents the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the warning message in this history is Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Okay, now when Samuel, uh, Samuel is going to be called in here, and he's also going to be given a warning message, which Eli is going to insist, tell me what it was. And we're told that whatever the message he was given, it's the message that causes your ears to tingle. And uh, I can give you the references if you want to write them down and see the other 
two places in the scriptures where your ears are caused to tingle. We might even just read them. Go to, um, I gotta check it. I don't know it off the top of my head. And this being my new Bible, I'm not so sure. I, yeah, 2 Kings 21, 12. Now what we're talking about, in verse 11 of 1 Samuel chapter 3, it says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel. This is when he finally goes and answers the Lord. The Lord says, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth shall tingle. And then in verse 17, Eli is asking Samuel after this happens. He says, what is the thing that the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. Okay, he wants to hear the message that the Lord gave to Samuel. So if you go to 2 Kings 21.12, you'll see there's only three places in the scriptures where your ears tingle. We've read the one in Samuel. And in 2 Kings 21.12, let's start in verse 11. It says, because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. Now, this is Manasseh the king of the southern kingdom, and notice what the next verse says, and I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down, and I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies. So he's saying, I'm going to stretch over Judah, the southern kingdom. Judah and Benjamin. I'm going to stretch over Jerusalem. The same kind of punishment that I've already accomplished, um, what would it be, 46 years prior in Samaria, the northern kingdom. I'm going to scatter them. The king of the north is going to come and scatter them. Okay, the king of the north coming and scattering the northern kingdom or the king of the north coming and capturing Manasseh and carrying to him to Babylon is an illustration of the Sunday law. Okay, and it causes their ears to tingle this, this message. And then if you go to Jeremiah 19, verse 3, it's the same but different. And say, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, the which whosoever heareth it, his ears shall tingle, because they've forsaken me, and so on and so forth. And what, what was the evil that he was promising to bring? Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to destroy Jerusalem. Okay, and Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in the AD 68 to 70 time period, AD 67, 70 time period. Both of those histories are identified when the king of the north comes and conquers spiritual Jerusalem at the Sunday law. Okay, so what I'm saying is, the prophet comes to Eli before 9-11 and gives him a warning about the Sunday law. Okay, the, the warning is expressed by this prophet that the very day that I accomplish this curse, your two sons are going to die. And we know the day that his two sons died is the day that he died. And it's the day the ark was captured. And it's the day that his grandson is named Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed. And it's talking about the structure of the Seventh-day Adventist church being overthrown fully and completely at the Sunday law. So Samuel's getting the same prediction. The Lord tells him the same story. Okay, second witness for Eli. Now what this tells us, if you're, willing to, if you're willing to see it, is the faithful priests here, they're going to give a message in this history that's been typified by the Millerites giving the midnight cry in their history. 
Okay, and when you begin to pull together the various lines of prophecy, where God's faithful people are marked here, several of them will be giving you the characteristics of what their message is. Okay, so I can tell you based upon Samuel that part of this prediction and this message that's proclaimed here, it's going to be saying that the Seventh-day Adventist church is going to be overthrown at the Sunday law. Because that's the message that causes your ear to tingle, whatever that tingling represents. Okay, so... As we're looking at this history, we're remembering that the, the, the promise of Moses is that the Lord was going to raise up a prophet like unto himself. Okay, and he says that twice, Moses does. He says it in verse 15 and verse 18 of Deuteronomy. Okay, so when you got Deuteronomy 18, 18 promising that the Lord is going to raise up a prophet like unto himself, it's kind of peculiar that William Miller is understanding his message in 1818. Okay, and he's, he's the messenger of this history, the first, the first message for the Millerite history, all right? It, there's, a, there's a prophetic message that comes in the Millerite history that is the first angel's message. This message, Daniel 11, 40, 45, at that level is the first angel's message for our history. Okay, it's, it's the Elijah message. And the Elijah message is followed by the Elisha message, right? Elisha message is the second angel's message. All right. I'm, I'm thinking I might be losing some of this. But, but brothers and sisters, let me, let me back up here. This is, the, this is the hard one after here. Okay. Samuel's going to be a prophet, priest, and judge. I'm saying that all three of these characteristics are in the ark. Okay, what are we judged by? The law of God. Ten commandments. Two tables. Four. Six. And they're bound together as one book. So right here's a turning point. And right here, this is the midnight cry. The midnight cry is a bright light, is it not? Okay, the bright light right here is the Shekinah. Because these reform lines are opening the temple. All right, you have Aaron's rod that buds, which is about the priesthood. The law of God is what judges us. The writings of Moses that are in the side of the ark. I don't know what it means in the side of the ark, but the, the statutes that he wrote are in the side of the ark, and he's a symbol here of the spirit of prophecy. The pot of manna, that's the pot of manna. That's the everlasting gospel, okay, that gets you to this point where you're either going to be a wise priest or a foolish priest. Um, okay. Uh, pardon me? Aaron's rod right there. All right. Not an artist, okay. We can all agree on that. So, um, in, in 2 Samuel 3, verse 15, it says, Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. This vision here is Mara. Okay. And uh, we want to look at the Mara vision a little bit. 15, 3.15, 1 Samuel 3.15, the word translated vision is Mara. Okay. Um, the definition of, of Mara from, what's it called, Esword, it says a mirror, looking glass, vision. It's the feminine of mare, which means appearance. The first mention of Mara in the scriptures. Let's go there. Genesis 46.
verse 1 of Genesis 46 says, And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for there I will, de- for I will there make of thee a great n- nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. And... Uh, Where's the word vision in there? Okay, yeah, I got scribbles over it. Visions, okay. So, where where is um, Jacob when he receives the Mara vision? He's at the midnight cry, but he's at Beersheba. Was there a time when Jacob... The, I know how I want to say this. This is Jacob's last recorded vision. But it's the first reference of Mara. Where's Jacob's first recorded vision? Dream, vision. Jacob's ladder, which is the house of God. Does Jesus illustrate the end from the beginning? So if you go back to the beginning, you're also going to see the characteristics of the Mara vision there in that history, but we won't go there. All we're looking at is the word Mara. Where is this taking place at? Beersheba. But we're placing it at the midnight cry. Okay, And we're placing the Mara here at the midnight cry with Samuel. So this is a second witness that is taking place in this history, right? Um, Jacob, Jacob, um, but it's at Beersheba. So what does Beersheba mean? What's Beer mean? Beer means well. Sheba means oath. This is the the well of the oath, the well of the seven times. And the reason I'm asking that is I mentioned last time that there is a symbol, and I thought more of you would understand it than do, but there are places in the Bible where it is referenced Dan to Beersheba or Beersheba to Dan. And I'm arguing that Beersheba to Dan is the history of the midnight cry to the Sunday law. Okay, so he's here at Beersheba. I'm inferring that Dan, in this sense, would be over here. It's this history here that is represented by Dan to Beersheba. Um, Go to Exodus 38, verse 8. The meaning of Mara in... Strong's is a mirror. And in verse 8 of Exodus 38, and he made the labor of brass and the foot of it of brass. 38.8. Exodus 38.8. And he made the labor of brass and the foot of it of brass and of the looking glasses of the woman. Um, the looking glasses of the woman assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. What is this word looking glass? Mara. Mara. Okay, so the Mara vision that Jacob had and that Samuel had is the vision of the looking glass. Okay, so what's the vision of the looking glass? Um, Go to 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 13. First Corinthians thirteen, nine through thirteen. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, what kind of glass? A looking glass, darkly, 
but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. So there is a time period where we look into the looking glass and what are we seeing? Pardon me? A reflection, a reflection but it's, it's a dark reflection. It isn't, it isn't clear, all right? In my marginal reference for darkly, it says a riddle, all right? But there comes a point in time to what happens after that. Read the verse. Verse 12. For, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Okay, so in this history here, this is a history that I purpose not to get too deep into because it's too complex for one day. All right. But if you read the Millerites, particularly the message of Samuel Snow, the Midnight Cry message. Okay, over here, all they were doing is predicting a year, 1843. But when 1843 passed, and the first day of 1844 was April 19th, 1844, the Lord was going to use Samuel Snow to explain the disappointment in such a way that it, the mistake could be cleared up, but more importantly, he was going to also use him to not only calculate 1844, but he was going to calculate the day and the month of 1844. So the midnight cry wasn't simply nailing down that it was 1844, not 1843, it was nailing down October 22nd, 1844. And when Samuel Snow gives his conclusion, he's concluding then on October 22nd, 1844, the Lord is going to return. This is the, the punchline to his conclusion. But this movement is called the what? The seventh month movement. Okay, so from here, from this history back here, April 19th, 1844, when this message of Samuel Snow finally gets nailed down on August 15, 1844, at the Exeter camp meeting. It's called the Seventh Month Movement. And when the pioneers are dealing with this Seventh Month Movement, they will tell you that October 22, 1844, is the fulfillment of Daniel 8.14. And Daniel 8.14 says, unto 2300... That's what it says. But in the Hebrew it says, evenings and mornings. Okay, so when they're, when they're calculating this history, if you go back into it, they're understanding that a day equals what? A year. Okay, so they're, they're understanding this to be the first day of 1844. Okay, so they're saying that this history here is the evening of the first day. Okay, the evening in the morning is the first day. The evening in the morning is the second day. So when they calculated this history, they came to conclude that the day begins when the sun goes down. That's the evening. But the very middle of the night, what do we call it? Midnight. So they taught that midnight of this history, based upon the evening in the morning of Daniel 8.14, was July 21st, 1844. Okay, they call this midnight. When Sister White addresses this, she doesn't say midnight. What does she say? Midway between when they first thought the Lord would return, that would have been April 18th, last day of 1843, and the time to which they afterward came to conclude, that would be here, so Sutter White says midway, but if you go into the pioneers, they call it midnight. And if you calculate, when Sister White says midway between April 19th, she doesn't say that, midway between they, when they first thought that he would appear and they afterwards came to understand that his appearance would take place. When she's saying midway, she's not saying it in a general sense. 
because the pioneers were saying midnight, and they were calculating it by counting the days in this, the, every day in this history, and then coming to the conclusion that the very dead center of this history that is the seventh month movement is July 21st. The sister wife's not disagreeing with the pioneers, she's confirming the pioneers. It's not an accident that the very first time that Samuel Snow preached the message that was the midnight cry was on July 21st, 1844, at the Boston Tabernacle. But it didn't, it didn't take hold like it was going to take hold on August 15th at the Exeter Camp meeting. So this history here, from midnight to the midnight cry, comes into our history and it illustrates a period of time right here, which is this period of time, which is the third step in this history. There are three steps. One, two, and the third is here. See why I wasn't going to go here today? You following the logic here, even if you're not understanding my point? When you get to here, this is where you and I are called to have the experience that all the prophets had that is identified as the Mara experience. Okay, It's the looking glass experience. H, not R. <laughs> what we just read was for now, in this history here, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Do we have a prophet that is identified as seeing the Lord face to face? Moses. Moses. Okay, let's, let's come back to this in a moment. Um, Let's finish off with the looking glass. Go to 2 Corinthians 3.18. We have to look at Moses having this experience. When Moses is going to have his experience that illustrates the experience of the prophets, where is he? What mountain is he on? Sinai. Is there another word for Sinai? Horeb. Okay, where is he in Horeb when the Lord passes by him? What's a cleft of the rock? A cave. So Moses is in a cave on the Mount of Horeb, and the Lord passes by. Does that ever happen again in the scriptures? Elijah. Elijah. So both Elijah and Moses are in a cave on Horeb, Mount Horeb, and the Lord passes by. And you can demonstrate that both of them are illustrating this history right here. This history right here that leads to the midnight cry. The history between midnight and the midnight cry. Where do we first get the, the first reference to the midnight cry from? The history of Moses? Yeah, what? The, okay, in that history, is it a progressive or a point in time? It's progressive. Now, not in that history. In that history, they're seeing the mare, which means appearance. It's probably spelled wrong, but you know what it means, appearance. And if you see the appearance of the Lord, you have two options. What are the two options? Face down in the earth. Face down in the earth. Or you can run away. Okay, one, one class is going to flee. The other class is going to have the experience of the prophets. Okay? The experience is represented by the feminine. That's the, the response of the church to the glory of the head of the church. Okay. And the, the vision of prophetic history, the child's own, it's the complete vision. It's the... All right. So anyway, we have to have that experience... But we're going to have that experience right here. And to have the Mara experience, according to what we just read in James, what are you looking into? The law. 
Okay, the law is right here. We've already put this in play. Okay, this is this here. This is both a this is a period of time, but it's point in time. <laughs> I can't go there, but it is. It's, when, you're, when you're here, this is where the temple is being opened, and you're seeing these truths, and it brings with it most definitely the truth of the law of God, which is part of what produces this experience that you go face down in the dust because you understand. How does Isaiah say it? I'm on my... My comeliness is turned into corruption. That's a good one. Okay, that, that fits. We understand. Um, go to Numbers 12, 6. I mentioned this before. We didn't read it, but I mentioned this. Numbers 12, verse 6. We're looking at Mara. And he said, verse 6 of Numbers 12, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a vision. What's that word vision? Mara. Mara. Okay, when the, the spirit of prophecy is being established, if it's genuine, whoever is getting established with that gift, they will have had the Mara experience. They will have seen the glory of the Lord and been humbled into the dust where they realize their corruption, but they're still willing to be a participant and the Lord's going to take a coal off the altar and purify their lips and make them a fit vessel in spite of their past experience. All right? So um, you don't get to that point if you don't have the Mara experience. I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a Mara vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Okay, so... 1 Samuel 3.15, he gets spoken to. Let's go look at another place where this Mara visions at. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. We're almost done with these, but not quite. Ezekiel 1, 1 says, Now it came to pass in the thirteenth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were open and I saw Mara, visions of God. Okay. Right at the beginning, Ezekiel's having this experience that any prophet's going to have if they're really a prophet. And when did he have this vision? The fourth month in the fifth day. Of course, this would be... If you plug in this date into the Millerite calculation of the history of 1844, the fourth month and the fifth day, is that what it said? is July 21st. Right here, at this side of this period of time, is where Ezekiel is marked as having this Mara vision. Are you, are you following the logic there? Okay, so this Mara vision, pardon me? All right. What don't you follow, my brother? If it's simple, I'll recap it. Oh yeah, the Karaite calendar. Do you, do you understand just basically what I'm referring to with the Karaite calendar? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I'm not sure how you got to I'm not proving any of it. Okay, I'm not proving any of it. When, when Samuel Snow starts working out the midnight cry message, he has basically four calendars at least that he's dealing with. He's dealing with the, our time, Gregorian time. He's got to express it in January, February, March, okay? But he has to go into the Bible and determine what the biblical reckoning was, all right? And there were two prevalent approaches to 
the Jewish calendar. There was the rabbinical and there was the Karaite reckoning. But there was also, uh, what do they call it? The, the civil calendar. So he's got three biblical calendars that he's working with. But he concludes correctly that he's going to use the Karaite reckoning of time. So once he's got that down pat, he's understanding that the the year 1844, the first day of it, in the Karaite reckoning time, equates to April 19th, 1844. That, that's January 1st for us. This is the first day of the Karaite reckoning of that year. And he ultimately concludes that the 10th day of the seventh month, when, which would be the Day of Atonement, is going to take place on October 22nd, 1844, based upon the Karaite reckoning of time. So if you have a Karaite calendar and they fluctuate, okay, they go through, a, through cycles over 19 years before they get back to where they started with. So you have to be in the right year to get the right. Some of their years have 13 months and some have 12 months. Okay, so they're do, and it works through a cycle of 19 years. Once you're in the right cycle for 1844, if you count all the days from the first day of the first month, which is April 19th in the Gregorian, to the 10th day of the seventh month, which is October 22nd, 1844 in the Gregorian, if you go to the dead center of that calculation, it brings you to July 21st. Okay, that's the dead middle of these, of these dates if you're going to use the, the calculation that Samuel Snow did, which we want to do, because there's a bright light set up behind us, which is the midnight cry, and it's his message that is represented there. So... We know that the first time he presented publicly the Midnight Cry message was in Boston here. Didn't take effect. The next time he presented it was at the Exeter Camp Meeting, and this is where the Midnight Cry is marked. But the pioneers understood that this wasn't the Midnight Cry, that this was midnight. When you go into what this little period of time here is, you find that this period of time represents the third step in our history. Our history is the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel is three testing messages, but the third test is different. The third test is where you are going to manifest the character that you've developed in the first two steps. Okay, so this history in the Millerites from July 21st to August 15th is typifying what goes on right here in this third step. Okay, and there's all kinds of stuff that goes on here. Okay, so when you go into, if you're going to approach biblical reckoning, and you're going to do it like Samuel Snow was doing, you're going to have to calculate it out on Karaite reckoning of time. Okay, so it's the fourth month, fifth day, is that what it is? Fourth month. Fifth, fourth month, fifth day. Okay, this is this here is the first day of the first month, Karaite reckoning. This is the tenth day of the seventh month. But we take that from Ezra. Yeah, but that, one thing, one thing at a time. So when you get to the, if you calculate this is the first day of the first month, second day, third day, fourth day, ultimately you're going to get to the fourth month. And when you do that, if you have a Karaite reckoning here, the fifth day of the fourth month equates. To July 21st, midnight. And that's when Ezekiel has his Mara vision. Now, if, if Tanya is right, and the part that you're really not understanding is Ezra 7 9. Ezra 7 9 is one of the keys of Samuel Snow's, Snow's equation of the midnight cry. Go to Ezra 7 9. Ezra 7 9. It's all right. That even those of us that have a good grasp of this, this is way, way over our heads, repeating it a few times, is not a problem. Verse 9 of Ezra 7. This is one of the points of reference that Samuel Snow used to calculate the midnight cry message. And it says, For upon the first day of the first month, Karaite reckoning of time, 
For upon the first day of the first month began he, Ezra, to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of, God, of, good hand of his God upon him. So the first day of the first month, right here, October or April 19th, 1844, on April 19th, 457 B.C., Ezra leaves Babylon. You with me? Okay, so according to Sister White, on April 19th, 1844, the tarrying time arrived, and so did the second angel's message. And what is the second angel's message? Come out of Babylon. Babylon's fallen. Right here, right here Ezra is leaving Babylon 2,300 years before the first disappointment in the tearing time. 2,300 days exactly to the very day. April 19th, 457 B.C., Ezra is leaving Babylon, and he gets to Jerusalem on the first day of the first month, which is August 15th, <coughs> 457 B.C., the very day that Samuel Snow is giving the midnight cry message in Exeter. The first day of the fifth month, 457 B.C., is when... Ezra arrives at Jerusalem, and from here to here, from the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month, is 120 days. Okay, that's, that's the 120 that we plug in, plug in here. And from the first day of the fifth month to the tenth day of the seventh month is 70 days. Where did I put the 120? Right there, 70 days. That's what we plug in here. A symbol of this history is the 120. A symbol of this history is the 70. Time is no longer, this isn't time. But when Ezra left Babylon, what did he have in his hand? The third decree. And the third decree goes into effect on October 22nd, 457 BC. And 2,300 years later, on October 22nd, 1844, the third message arrives. Okay, that was the logic of Samuel Snow that made up the midnight cry message. But when the pioneers were talking about that history, they note July 21st as midway. It's the middle of this. And it equates to the fifth day of the fourth month. Yeah. And that's when Ezekiel receives the Mara vision, right on time, right where it's supposed to be. Okay, because in this history right here, in Numbers 12, 6, it says if he's going to raise up a prophet, he's going to give him the Mara vision. And what's the story of Samuel about, among other things? What were we emphasizing? Not about the priesthood. But what was there in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1? What wasn't there? There was no open vision. Okay, so part of the story of Samuel is the restoration of the spirit of prophecy. So when Samuel gets down here and the Lord gives him the Mara vision, the Lord's going to give the Mara vision to someone that he's raising up to be a prophet. So Samuel's being raised up to be a prophet a priest and a, and a judge right here at the midnight cry. Are we up to speed on that? It, this, is, this is not not so easy the first time through without a doubt. Okay, so time check. Anyone know? Yeah, I know what time it is, but I don't remember when we started. <laughs> We started at 2.40 something? Almost enough. Okay, I don't think you have these in your notes, so I'm going to read some of them. Ah. Go to Daniel. I almost left out the punchline. We don't want to leave out the punchline. <laughs> Daniel chapter 10. Verse 7. Let's start in verse... Well... Let, let's, let's just... I'll give you a brief overview of the first four verses, because you all know it. Samuel, Daniel's going to get the Mara vision. Okay, and so we're going to suggest that Daniel's 
revelation of the Mara vision is going to plug in here, right where all the other prophets' Mara visions plug in, right in this history here. So, what is it? How long has, has Daniel been fasting when he gets to this point? 21 days. Okay, so in verse 5, it says, Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked. Behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body was like beryl in his face as the appearance of lightning. Where it says appearance of lightning, appearance is the definition of the mare, and the Hebrew word that's translated as appearance here is what? Mare. Okay, so Daniel's seeing the mare vision. He's seeing the appearance of Christ, and Sister White says this, this vision here in Daniel is the same vision that John had in the revelation of Christ. Okay, this is, this is seeing Christ and his glory, seeing him. The Mara isn't about, it's about seeing him, but it's not emphasizing seeing him. It's the response that someone has when they see Christ in his glory, in his appearance. Okay? They're the same word, one is masculine, one is feminine. But it's talking about cause and effect. The cause is the vision of Christ, his glory, his appearance. The effect is one or two options. Okay? So in verse 6, his body was like, the barrel and his face is the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire and his arms and his feet in color to polish brass and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the Mara vision. For the men that were with me saw not the Mara vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. So when you get to here, how many, how many classes of worshipers are going to be here? Two. And Daniel represents the wise virgins that are going to have the, the correct response, the correct effect to the cause of the Mari vision. But the foolish virgins of this history, they're going to flee. Okay, this is right here on July 21st at the beginning of this little box. The first thing that happens is the wise and the foolish are separated. And that's what you're seeing here in verse 7. But a great, great quaking fell upon themselves, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. He's in his sleep. What's happening here? Yeah, but we're just, we're, he's asleep. This is the parable of the ten virgins, isn't it? What wakes him up? The minute they're sleeping, he's sleeping here, okay? He's on the verge of the midnight cry. He's about to be awakened. Okay, his face on the ground. And behold, a hand, what? Okay, in this, in this history, Right here, that Daniel's experience, how many times is he going to be touched? He's going to get touched three times. Let's count them. Verse 10, And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hand. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee I am now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the for from the first day that thou didst set, set thine heart to understand it, to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I'm come forth for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I'm come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for the vision is yet for many days. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb, and behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Second touch. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the visions of my, my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can thy servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. If there's no breath in you, what are you? You're dead. We're going to read a quote in a minute. Okay. 
Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. Third touch. And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. Doubling. Right here, right at the end of this three-touch process. Be strong, yea, be strong. Uh, where was I? Verse 19. And when he had spoken in me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Okay. How, Tanya, don't say that. <laughs> I want him to think this through. How many times does Daniel get touched in the book of Daniel? Who said that? Oh, I thought that was Tanya. No, if it was Tanya, she might have been in trouble. What did you, are you answering with sign, sign language? Five, okay. He gets touched five times. All right. Yeah. She, as much as Tanya, she should know it. But I, I want to put that in the record, okay? That from 9-11 to here, because this is where we're placing Daniel in this story, is from 9-11 to here, there's actually five touches. Three of them go on here, and two here. Okay, because the, this, these, these five steps, they're illustrated other places. So let me, let me read a couple quotes, and then we'll take a breath, break. This history here, is an illustration of death. Okay, and, and this history here, if you bring Moses' story in here, Moses dies here, Aaron dies here, there is a death that goes on here. Aaron is replaced with Eliezer, and Eliezer is the Hebrew word for Lazarus. Okay, and this, you can show, this is where Lazarus is resurrected. Because Sister White says, that the midnight cry of the Millerite history has been typified by the triumphal entry in the time of Christ. So this waymark of the midnight cry would be the triumphal entry in the time of Christ. And in the time of Christ, when he was coming in Jerusalem on that colt, who was leading the procession? Lazarus. And it was his sealing, crowning act of his ministry. This resurrection here is marked by Lazarus and Eliezer, so there's a resurrection marked here that has to do with the death that goes on here, and the death that goes on here is the birth pangs of being sealed into the family of the second Adam. Okay, there's two families of Adam in the scripture. And you and I, through no, no choice of our own, we get born into the family of the first Adam. And in the condition that we are born, we are unsavable. We have to be put under the umbrella of grace by our parents or our guardians until we reach the time of accountability. And at that point, we can choose to have an experience with Christ, which provides for us the infilling of the Holy Spirit, making us a combination of humanity and divinity. But when we are born into the family of the first Adam, we are born into the family of humanity that does not possess divinity. Okay, so, so in here, this death that's taking place is the final death of those of us that have, through no choice of our own, been born into the family of the first Adam. But now, through the choices we make, we have the privilege of being resurrected into the family of the second Adam, and that family, the nature of that family, is the combination of divinity and humanity. So this death that is being illustrated in here is the process of being forever sealed into the family of the second Adam, if that is a good way to illustrate it. Two quotes, we'll take a break. This is from Review and Herald, December 20th, 1881. It is not in your notes. Review and Herald, December 20th, 1881. True holiness and humility are inseparable. The nearer the soul comes to God, the more completely it is humbled and subdued. When Job heard the voice of the Lord out of the whirlwind, he exclaimed, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. It was when Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord and heard the cherubim crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, that he cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone. Daniel, when visited by the holy messenger, says, My comeliness was turned in me to corruption. 
Paul, after he was caught up into the third heaven and heard things that it was not lawful for a man to utter, speaks of himself as less than least of all the saints. It was the beloved John that leaned upon Jesus' breast and beheld his glory, who fell as one dead before the angel. The more closely and continuously we behold our Savior, the less shall we see to approve in ourselves. All of these prophets she is using to identify the same experience, and John falls as one dead. Next quote, Sermons and Talks, Volume 1, page 104. You know, just as soon as the heavenly messenger came from heaven and revealed himself to Daniel, he said, my comeliness was turned in me into corruption. He had such a view of the glory of God that he fell as one dead. Now that's coming from the experience of John in the Revelation, and she's applying it to Daniel, thus showing us that everyone that's raised up as a prophet goes through this, has this experience, this Mara vision. But this experience includes a death to the... It's just something about our human nature that has to be resolved in order for us to be sealed. Okay. One more. Select the message. This is book 3, page 390. When the angel was about to unfold to Daniel the intensely interesting prophecies to be recorded for us who are to witness their fulfillment, the angel said, Be strong, yea, be strong. We are to receive the very same glory that was revealed to Daniel because it is for God's people in these last days that they may give the trumpet a certain sound. So when we're placing Daniel in this history, saying it's taking place to here, and telling you that this is to be our experience, Spirit of Prophecy repeatedly says this. Okay, this isn't just human conjecture. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you would offer the opportunity that we could have this experience and actually behold your glory, but we are unprepared. We ask that the, the work that needs to be done in each of our hearts and each of our minds to get us to the point to where we can also participate in the experience that has been illustrated and recorded of and by the prophets that we can be among those represented by Daniel that fall down as one dead rather than those that fled with a great quaking. We want to understand what's taking place at the midnight cry, what is being accomplished by you, that we may be part of that work. So we ask for your continued presence as we continue on in our studies for the the rest of this day, we ask that during this break time you would refresh our minds and our hearts that we can come back and uh, continue to focus upon these wonderful truths that you're opening up to us. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>